Britney is all about. It's all about Cook 27. And this is a debrief um, session. So I'll be reading out um, some rules that we have to follow. Please ensure that our microphones are turned off. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature in the Zoom meeting. At the end of the webinar, the panelists will answer all your questions if you have one. So you can just simply use the I am raise your hand icon and you'll be unmuted. Then you can ask your question. I hope you understand. Hello? I hope the rules are clear. Yes, they are clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I wanted to be sure I'm not talking to myself because everywhere seems awfully quiet. Oh, thank you. Okay. So uh, now let's go into the introduction of our panelists. So we have uh, three intelligent panelists. We have three intelligent panelists with us. The first one is um, she, Jennifer Uchendu. We all know her as Susti Mama. I'm reading her biography. Now, Jennifer holds a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Covenant University and a master's degree in development studies. She specialized in climate change and gender at the institution at, at the Institute of Development Studies, University of Sussex. She is a 2021 Ash Ashkar Fellow, a 2019 Shevnin Scholar a 2018 Bill and Melinda Gates goalkeeper, a 2018 Mandela Washington Fellow, and also the co-author of an ebook, A Guide to Business Sustainability in Nigeria. Jennifer sits on the board of environmental focused organizations such as ONCA, an art charity in the UK, and Givo, a tech startup focused on the circular economy in Nigeria. So our second um, panelist is Aziz, Aziz Salawu. Aziz Salawu, a Nigerian, is a youth in agriculture advocate and climate activist with broad experience in mobilizing the youth for climate action, food and nutrition, security and sustainability development in Nigeria. He is the founder and executive director at Community Action for Food, CAFS, a registered not-for-food, not-for-profit organization committed to promote a food secure Africa through the provision of efforts that support sustain sustainable agriculture and enhance livelihood. As this currently serves as a youth leader for the UN Food Systems, submit dialogue where he coordinates all the youth engagement with national convener in Nigeria, and ambassador, Climate 2020 Conference, Hamburg, Germany 2020. As this is a leader, Climate Reality Leadership Group, the convener, annual food, Se food security future summit, an alumnus member of FAO, FAO, Global Forum on Food Security and Nutrition, member of Global Food Security Cluster, member of Agricultural Society of Nigeria, member of Nigerian Civil Society, Framework of Paris and Agreement and SDGs. He's also a member of Youth Liaison in support of UN Food and UN Food System Summit. As this has participated in high level discussion and negotiation, both at the international and local levels, on critical development issue on climate change, agriculture, sustainable development, human rights, and policy reforms. As this operates effectively at the governmental and policy level, as well as citizen and community level, he has a master degree in crop production. And our third panelist is Mohammed Shamsuddin Ibrahim. Mohammed is a climate justice activist, digital story, right, storyteller, grassroots mobilizer, and certified teacher. 
It currently supports a variety of donor-funded institutional building initiatives with a focus on good governance, climate change education, understanding and mitigation. Committed to strengthening capacity, understanding and citizens engagement mechanism for better approaches towards transparency and accountability in governance. Public service, climate change mitigation and adaptation in Africa through research policy, advocacy and practice. He has four years experience implementing, supporting, and working on donor-funded projects, PRB, USAD, UNDP, PACGA, Embassy of Netherlands, MacUta Foundation, World Bank, AFDP, US Department of State, on a variety of institution now building initiative with a focus on good governance and, climatic, and climate change. Education, understanding, and mitigation. He holds a Nigerian certificate in chemistry, integrated science from Federal College of Education in Zaria, Nigeria. Please let's mute our mics. Thank you. Please let's mute our mics. Thank you. As well as a bachelor's degree in chemistry education and from Amadou Bello University in Zaria. Thank you very much. So um, we are going into the question proper. So we're starting with Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, How are you? I'm doing well. You're welcome. We are happy to have you here. Hi, everyone. So um, my, hi. my first question for you is, after the hype and stress of COOP, what really happens? I'm coming from the angle of government, individuals, the national bodies, and NGO. Well, yeah, sure. That's a good question. And I'm happy we're doing this, like a debrief to talk about everything that went on at COP27. Um, as many people know, it's the 27th COP. So it means that every other year, world leaders, stakeholders have come together to discuss climate change and what to do about it. So um, agreements are made at COP, commitments are made, investments are made, um, decisions are reached, um, decisions that every party has to adhere to, um, negotiations happen, you know, every side of the table comes with their best foot forward to negotiate what works for them in their particular context. After COP, the expectation is that we go back with this agreement and begin implementation. We go back with these commitments or investments and you know, begin to work, work on them. So for example, in um, 2015, um, if I'm not mistaken, where we had the Paris Agreement, for example, when the Paris Agreement came into play, you know, that became another set of agreements for us to work with. Everyone was working to say, we're going to keep global temperatures below 1.5 degree. But now we're here several years down the line. And, you know, a lot of world leaders are seeing that it's not even working out. We're not able to keep that end of the bargain because they've continuously and consistently refused to face out fossil fuel you know, even as rich countries, even poor countries are saying, nope, we're not going to do that. You know, we're still going to use it to develop. And that's just the reality. So at COP27, a couple of agreements were reached and I would share a link um, on some of those outcomes with us, but it helps you to see that a lot of things happened with adaptation, <clears throat> but more significantly, a lot of us from the global South went into COP27 asking for two things asking for the rich countries, the global north, to emphatically agree to face out you know, fossil fuel because they themselves, you know, there's that hypocrisy where they themselves haven't um, you know, 
met their own side of the bargain. They're still dealing with coal, they're still dealing with fossil fuel. So we've asked, you know, we're saying it has to be phased out and it has to be, you know, go completely across board. And there has to be an ethical transition for developing countries, you know, to move into cleaner forms of fuel. So that was one um, demand. The second one was for loss and damage. And I know there's a question around that, but part of what we came out from loss and damage, you know, I, I remember talking to Sustainable survivors about the negotiations where um, the Global South was saying there needs to be a funding facility for the impacts of the climate crisis that are beyond climate adaptation, that are beyond climate um, change mitigation. There has to be a fund to compensate people who are already suffering from the impact of the crisis. Take Pakistan, you know, take several countries in the Global South, Bangladesh, which already, you know, have these impacts in immense impact saying we really, really, really need to compensate them. And we talk about, you know, compensation that is even beyond finance, because for example, if someone dies as a result of a climate related disaster, how much really can you pay for a life? So we really went into COP27, going on lots of protests, interviews, you know, as civil society organizations, um, saying that parties must agree to fund loss and damage. And we came out of COP27 with something at least, the agreement that says there would be a funding facility, which is a win because this has been, I think, a 30 year um, battle you know, it's been for it's been on for the longest. People say climate justice is a real thing, and you need to compensate. You need to support. So um, now that we've come back from COP twenty seven, what's the next step? Unfortunately, it's still going to go boil down to COP twenty eight for when the monies will come in. You know, for when monies will come in for the implementation and people being supported, how that accountability system and transfer system would work is a whole different ball game. But at least now we have something in terms of a funding facility. So that's you know, like that's how it works. You know, several agreements came, but loss and damage was a big one. There was the Shamel Sheikh adaptation plan, which I was part of a bit, and I can also touch on that, but I would allow other panelists, you know, speak. Up, but yeah, that's kind of what happens, unfortunately. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was really enlightening. Um, my next question is for Aziz. Jennifer already spoke on the um the outcome, and I want to ask you in a layman term, what are the few ways attendance at COP27 events will help a youth trying to track his or her career path? How does this COP27 help a youth that is trying to? chat a, a career path for him or so, you yourself. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Good evening, everyone. It's really excited. I'm really excited to actually join everyone here. And just straight to the question. So talking about uh, how you know, young people can actually pick one or two things from, from COP27, I would say that a lot of things are actually happening even before COP. Uh, for example, myself, I've been doing a lot of things around uh, agriculture, climate smart agriculture, and around the food systems. And last year in UK was just my first call. And this year was the second one. So I feel that uh, when it comes to the issue of climate change, it's actually very, very diverse. For example, in Nigeria, we have like six to seven ministries that has one or two things to do with directly with climate change, talking about Ministry of Agriculture, Environment, Water Resources, Ministry of Power, Transportation, you know, I can even say virtually all the ministries, maybe direct, indirectly as one of the things to do with climate change. So it's actually very, very broad. And as a young person, it is very strategic for you to actually identify your area of uh, passion, your area of interest, and just align to it. Then once you are able to align to it, you will now begin to understand that, OK, yes, there is actually a group that, that does what uh, uh, I'm actually planning to do, or I'm, I'm, already, I'm already doing. Because uh, it may interest you to know that there's uh, nothing that you're actually planning to do or you, that you're doing that another person is actually not doing. So, the question will not be that what is it that you are bringing, you know, differently, and how are you willing to collaborate with the existing bodies on ground? That would really help 
uh, you understand what we are actually trying to do, especially in the area of climate change. Like myself, I work around climate change and uh, my, my, my core area is on the food systems, climate smart agriculture, and I'm very, very key around adaptation. And that is my own area of focus. We have some people that they are very, very strong around energy. Some people are strong around the mitigation. Some people are strong, you know, it's different area, water management and every other thing. So it's actually, it will be, so to start with, it's very important for you to identify your area of strength, then identify the people that are working in that area. Then COP will now, you know, start getting, you start getting to understand what COP is really about. Because once you're able to identify that primary uh, area of focus, it will now help you to it will guide you to now understand, yes, which area and which area am I looking at when it comes to COP interactions, COP negotiations. If that is not going to happen, trust me, you just go to COP and just, you know, attend different things and, uh, you know, come back with the same thing. So I think uh, strategically, as a young person, there's need for you to start with something, then now align it with what is really happening around COP, and it would make more meaning and more sense in that way. Because, going, like last year, my first time at COP, everything was looking so so colorful. Uh, I was just going from one pavilion to the other, not really understanding what is happening. But I left, and now my focus this year was around issues around loss and damage, and a lot of uh, strategic partnership we're actually following up with and other secondary activity. So I understood where I, what I actually needed to do at COP27. I didn't even go to the first one. I got to the COP27 on, on, on the Thursday, and I left on the Wednesday because of other commitments. And that was my calendar. So I already mapped out what I want to do, and I made sure I achieved it to a minimum you know, extent. And that is how I feel young people can actually you know, partake in it. It's very, very simple align yourself with anything you're actually doing. And uh, of course, around the SDGs, and from there, you pick it up through partnerships, engagement, and collaboration in the sector. Thank you so much. It's over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, love, I, I, I got some points um, from what you said. You talked about strategy, you talked about alignment, talked about partnership. So I think we 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 are we are a youth community. So I think we understand that we first have to find our area of interest before we now decide that okay, before we now form strategy towards um, what align towards what we um, pick as our interest. So we are um, going to Mohammed. This question is for you. So Jennifer talked about um, one thing that um, they brought from the COP twenty seven is um, funding for loss and damage. So uh, my question is. Idea report created to measure the success and impact of the conference each year. If yes, where can we get that report? Like, where can we get the report? Hi, Mohamed. Hello. Um, sorry, I I had network issue. I didn't hear you clearly. Just can you repeat the question? Okay, I said, are there reports? created to measure the success and impact of the conference each year? If yes, where can we get that report? Like, how can we access the report that we can use to measure? Jennifer spoke on um, one thing that this year, COP27, like one of the success is the loss and damage funding that they were able to at least um, advocate for that. So I want to, so I want, so my question now is, the report, are they reports created to measure the success and impact of every conference, like COP27, COP26? And if yes, how can we get that report? That was, that's my question. Okay, Raul, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful question. And um, the question is timely because most people don't uh, know where to find them reports and um, outputs from all negotiations done at COP. And um, I'm glad uh, there is actually, for each COP that takes place, there is a page on uh, the UNFCCC website where you can find documents regarding all agreements, all negotiations available. And um, there are even organizations that usually take time to compile all such information 
I'm sure like for this year, I had a series of information from uh, the carbon brief because um, at COP actually, I followed strictly some negotiations and um, round tables on the global stock take, which is uh, a mechanism to measure success or progress in the implementation of NDCs towards achieving the Paris Agreement uh, goal of 1.5. And um, since I was not able to be part of, uh, to follow up with other negotiations, I find details of information made available by Carbon Brief with documents that I can be able to download and go through. So I'm sure there are a lot of organizations, even the UNFCCC, make all those information available. And um, I can see that uh, Jennifer even posted one of the pages, the web, web page where you can find um, such information. But um, for that of the carbon brief, actually they made, it, they made it simple where an individual, especially for newbies like us, can be able to grasp the information and be able to follow up with what is going on and how it is done. And um, I think I have a link to the document from a uh, carbon brief and um, I'll, I'll drop it on the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question is for Jennifer. So we have, we've talked about um, what really happens. We've talked about the, we've talked about, so now we're going to talk about the costs. So what is the average financial cost of attending a COP27 event? The average financial cost, what would it cost on an average to attend a COP27 event? Thanks, Victoria. To be honest, and I mean, <laughs> we're from the global south. A lot of the times we do really good work throughout the year and applications and opportunities come up for young people to apply. So oftentimes you find that youth leaders or reps and stakeholders who are attending COP have been either sponsored by their organizations or you know, they applied to something that was happening internationally and they were supported. So a lot of people are usually supported to come to COP. So there's a general idea in terms of having real and genuine youth participation at events as COP. So it's important that you know, organizations put out funding to support young people to get into spaces like COP, to, you know, to get them their tickets, get them their accommodation. I do know some people who you know, really feel very strongly about attending conferences like COP and figure out ways to sponsor themselves. Now, the very first, it's not something I would potentially advise. You, know, you could maybe pally up with an NGO, find some support support and you know work together even if it's a local NGO one thing we're looking at at Sussy Vibes is how can we have accreditation status so that even some of our people can go you know we can get them some funding so that's usually a preferred way but if you know people feel very strongly to attend the first place is to get accreditation now this year for COP accreditation was really really tough um, I don't know if some of you saw Lekwa and I spoke to, I think, two different media organizations. I did Guardian. Lekwa spoke to BBC about how extremely difficult it was to get accreditation. Accreditation is basically your badge to enter, you know, to say, oh, I'm being expected at this conference. And it was really, really difficult. There were lots of, you know, limitations. People could assess week one, they couldn't access week two and stuff like that. So that's the very first place to start from. And to do that, you either go as a party observer or as an observer. A party means you're going through your government's delegation or as part of, you know, you get the accreditation from your government. Um, Observer means you're getting it from civil society, so an NGO that has an accreditation status. Um, some people go as press, so journalists also have ways they get accreditation. I think there are other, other forms. There was one I used one time that was straight from the UN, so you're coming in 
you know, being accredited, accredited by the UN directly. So different people find ways to get the accreditation. That's usually the first place. Then you have to check the cost of tickets. Obviously, it's dependent on the country. So you don't pay anything to be at COP itself in terms of entering the conference. It's completely free of charge. Even getting accreditation is free of charge. But then you have to fly yourself there. You have to, you know, figure out accommodation. Most times people would do um, shared accommodation, you know, stay with friends, go as a group or something. And then you have to figure out your cost of living because you're basically a tourist in a new place. You expect that it to be significantly higher than, you know, wherever you're coming from. So there's all of that to factor in, um, but you don't have to pay, you know, to be a cop. I think that's really important. And the very first place is, you know, getting accreditation, finding NGOs that have accreditation status to support or going through your government. So I know a few um, young people from Nigeria were able to get accreditation from the Nigerian government this year and even last year. So those are some of the, you know, first things to consider. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Accreditation. I just I wrote that down. <laughs> thank you very much. My next question is for Aziz. So um what are major lessons or experience, like your own major lessons or experience from attending COOP 27? Like what are the things that you've learned? Or what are your experiences? How has it been attending um, this COOP 27? All right, thank you so much. So I actually went to COP 27 this year with uh, mixed feelings because of uh, last year experience, I got to know that uh, a lot of things actually happened at negotiation uh, room. And a lot of people really you know, don't know about it. It's, it's really, really sad. So I, I actually looked forward to a, a lot of uh, discussion around uh, loss and damage, and uh, of course around the food systems, which was really, really good for me. And uh, part of the experience I, I, I got to realize was everything happening at COP in terms of uh, you know, sealing deals, in terms of you know, launching projects, all of them happened at COP as a ceremony. Mm. So, for, for example, so for example, uh, of course, we actually recorded a lot of some success at COP. You know, Egypt, you know, Egypt, uh, Egypt governments partnering with different uh, organizations and donor agencies to launch different initiatives. You know, the uh, the the uh, European Union, you know, committing and collaborating with with US, Japan, and several other European you know, around just transition. You know. Uh, mobilizing a, a sum of twenty billion dollars was actually uh, it was actually to help uh, Indonesia shut down their coal power plant. You know, so I, I got to realize this year that all of those things happened even before COP. So when they package everything, they take it to COP and launch it. And after launch, what what next? So most of most most of uh, uh, young people you know I, I don't know maybe my own from my own experience i feel that we 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 need to align ourselves in that way even nigeria went to cop with some commitments yeah it, so young people were actually of course all, all stakeholders were actually carried along around that but i i think there's actually a need for us to you know start thinking of how we can also come up with something like that you know, across board because COP it's 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 not for it's not for Nigeria, it's not for Africa. It's a worldwide thing. Like this year, we, we have uh, we have a little over thirty five thousand attendants at COP this year. It was really really serious. But I now get to understand that most of those you know activities that were actually ongoing at COP have been discussed. They've been approved. It's just for them to you know celebrate and launch it officially using a platform which COP created. So I think, I think uh, for example, during the UNDA in, uh, in, in New York, the AFDB president mentioned some commitments and they were actually you know, planning to actually launch it at COP. It was very strategic because they mentioned it during the UNDA in New York. And before COP, UNDA was September, COP was November. Before COP, they, we had other government and other donor agencies willing to key into that initiative 
And as COP, we had more people joining and supporting that initiative. So that was the idea. So I think I think the experience is actually uh, very, very good for me because now uh, we're actually really strategic, uh, positioning ourselves strategically both at national and international level to see how we can now key into those activities. Because the next thing, for example, in, in, in the food sector, the, the, the FAST initiative and the ICANN initiative was actually launched with the Egyptian embassy, FAO, WFO, DFID, and some other you know, donor agencies. And the template for implementation is already on ground. How do we key into those things? So keying into it, it is not something you can just you know, jump on when you're actually not part of the, of, the, of the process, the consultation and some other things. So I think going forward, there's actually a need for us to, uh, for example, COP28 next year in Dubai, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of successes are actually, you know, they, they, they were actually, uh, uh, they, 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 that came about you know, through this COP27. Activities already started after COP27. How do we make sure we are actually part of those activities? In line with the mission and vision of our different organizations, I think going forward there's need for us to align ourselves, especially at national level, because everything that has been that has been committed in that place is still going to it's still going to force them to different countries. So how do Nigerian as, as Nigeria as, as a country you know benefit from all those commitments? Benefiting from all those commitments, of course, it's still going to come to Nigeria. But then how do you know? Ordinary people, people in the rural community, how do they even get to know that yes, this was actually uh, you know made? And the funny thing is that most of these most of these activities, you know, uh, the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the 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 bottom line would be that yes, they were actually planning or trying to solve a, a problem of some rural communities and some communities in Nigeria. And even those communities, those don't even know that you made you went there to actually you know talk about their problems. Of course, coming with a solution, they really need to, you know, get abreast of what is happening. So I think going forward, there's need for us to actually key into those initiatives. For 28, of course, there's going to be a lot of our progress reports and new initiatives are going to be launched. There's need for us to identify a uh, uh, mind-like uh, organizations to see how we can actually collaborate together and make COP more meaningful, you know, for young people to actually engage and participate in going forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, wonderful answer. Um, my question is for Mohammed. So, how do people get funded or sponsored to attend COP27 in the future? As is mentioned, COP28 is going to be happening in Dubai. And me, for one, I want to attend. So, how do people, young people, Get funded or sponsored to attend. Sorry, sorry. I need to. I need to. You know, make your. So it's it's not really in Dubai. It's in Abu Dhabi. So Abu oh, Dhabi, okay. Dubai is one hour away from Abu Dhabi. So please have that in the back of your mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mohammed, hello. Yes, I I am with you. I'm waiting for Aziz to conclude before I intervene. <laughs> Okay. And, and actually getting question? funding yes i do yes. getting funding to attend cop um okay. it's something a bit crazy lately especially with the experience we had um with cop 27 you realize um there are a lot of organizations willing to fund young people but for COP27, it's way too expensive more than even COP26 that takes place in the UK. So I think for COP27, one of the major challenges where a lot of young people we are not able to attend is because of that. And um, being able to get funding, it's somewhat a tricky uh, process, just like um, Jennifer mentioned. One of the key things is for you to position yourself well, build a brand for yourself and um, get what you are doing for the grassroots communities and um, there are organizations willing to fund um, young people to cop but you have to prove to them that yes you are the right person to be funded to cop and you are the right person to represent the voices of people in these grassroots communities you work with and um, like for me this year 
it, it was a bit very challenging for me to get funding. My funders for COP26 last year said they don't have funding to fund me. In fact, none of them is attending COP because of how expensive uh, accommodation, flight and stuff have been at Sham. And um, towards the last minute, um, I happened to be a part of the global stock take uh, group of Yungu because I'm an active NDC's working group member. And um, an opportunity came up from the UNDP that they have a climate promise, which is to fund two active NDC working group members to COP. And um, I am supposed to be part of a, a roundtable dialogue at the SBase that takes place in Bonn. But uh, unfortunately, because I was there, not there in person, I was not able to attend. So because I am representing Yungu to be part of the roundtable dialogue on uh, means of implementation with emphasis on financial flows for glo uh, global South uh, nations or countries, capacity building and um, technology and innovation. I was able to be funded by UNDP, even though uh, due to some challenges, actually even the funding came in in another dimension. So I think one of the key issues still I'll go back to is positioning yourself to ensure that you make yourself essential that these organizations will feel no matter what this person has to be at COP. And one of the key strategies to do that is to ensure that you preach, you actually act what you preach. You ensure that even if it is as little as creating awareness within grassroots communities, do a lot of things we do here, especially in Nigeria as young people, we actually underrate the impact we are making. But when we go to the global community, we realize that we are the ones doing the real job and they are just watching and they have better PR than us. So the globe, the world sees them better than us. And, um, and I can attest to the fact that Jennifer might have come across this and Aziz also that when you are in such a global platforms, you realize that what people are doing from other nations or countries compared to what you are doing, some of the things you consider as just your civic responsibility, something that you must have to do it to make the environment better. These are things that other people in other countries leverage on to get such opportunities. So I think one of the e key e things we have to also put into consideration is ensuring that we have adequate digital uh, footprint, social media footprint across all our media pan uh, platforms. People should know that when, like, like whenever I had the name of Aziz, I know there are issues around ensuring access to food security, amplified food systems. When I hear Jennifer, I, I know that there, she works around issues of uh, empowering people, educating them on issues around climate change. So whenever I hear of any opportunity for someone on, in education, climate education, the first person that will pop up on my mind is Jennifer. When I hear about any opportunity on food systems, food security, the first person that will pop in my mind is Aziz. Okay. Because I know that is his area of strength. That is his area of uh, expertise. Not that we become jacks of all trade and masters of none. So I think uh, these two key points are very important in order for one to access funding to attend COP. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I love that. That was really great. So he spoke about positioning yourself and having a media presence. So I'm um, talking about, I'm going to be asking Jennifer the last question. So um, what, you, talk, you spoke about loss and damages. So now my question is around that. So what is the urgency of loss and damage financing? And how is it different from climate change, adaptation and mitigation? Absolutely, that's a good question. So, I mean, there's been a conversation for a very long time about the idea of climate justice or injustice as it were. 
So because we've always looked at climate change from a scientific point of view, we'll just say, oh, weather is changing, global warming is happening. But the truth is that it's not affecting everyone in the same way. You know, um, you look at the global south, you look at Africa in particular, we're more vulnerable to the impact of the climate crisis. Now, for the longest time, activists, frontline communities, civil society organizations have been sort of appealing, you know, and demanding for reparations and compensation to say, look, this thing is not fair. You know, you have explore, exploited fossil fuel for several years, you've developed, you know, and now the repercussion of that, we are still struggling to develop. And at the same time, the impact of the crisis is hitting us even more. So we don't have the safety nets to cope. We don't have the funding to build infrastructure to buffer ourselves. We don't have the resilience needed. And it's just not fair. So a flood, for example, hits a place like Belgium. And you know, people are talking about insurance. People are talking about how you know, they were so frightened. They were having nightmares. But fl a flood like that, even possibly half of that, hits a place like Nigeria. And we see the impact. You know, we see thousands of people get displaced. We see farmlands being eroded. So it's the fact that the impacts of the climate crisis have now gone beyond what we would say, you know, before people would say, oh, how do you tackle climate change? To talk about mitigation, reduce your emissions as much as possible, use technology, use um, tree planting, use carbon sequ uh, sequestration and all of that. Let's try and reduce the emissions as much as possible. And on the other hand, let's figure out ways to adapt. You know, let people learn resilience, let people learn how to build things, local infrastructure, adaptation, new ways of living even with climate change. But the reality is that those two pillars are not enough. There still needs to be additional provision to support people and thousands of people, millions of people who are already bearing the brunt of the climate crisis. And that is the big picture of you know, loss and damage. The fact that there's loss and there's damage that both reducing your emissions, finding ways to adapt would not be able to, you know, tackle. So we need to address it. We need to look at, for example, the psychological impacts of, um, uh, of the climate crisis of, on people. There are places, for example, in India, um, in Bangladesh, where farmers are literally having to commit suicide because they've collected loans and you know, seasonal changes happen. They're not able to get yield. They don't know how they'll be able to pay up. And they just feel like, see, it's better we'll just commit suicide. That is a climate disaster in itself. How do you support people like that to avoid you know, issues around suicide, mental health breakdowns? How do you um, support people to avoid displacement to ensure that they can even continue school, you know, go back to school? So it's a block of funding that is put together to address and compensate you know, people who are already experiencing the impact of the climate crisis beyond what climate mitigation and adaptation will be able to address. Obviously, there's a whole lot you know, um, that's, that's put into it. There's a whole lot around accountability. What's the best framework to do this? What's the climate justice? Who's to pay? You know, who's not to pay? What are countries doing on their own in terms of their own national determined contributions and all? So there's several you know, technicalities to it, but that's the central picture. The idea of loss and damage, um, that's what everyone just needs to know. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really enlightening. My next question is for Aziz. You, when you spoke about your lesson and your experiences, you talked about some of your disappointment. So my question is centered around that. What do you think youth can do better? Like, what can we as youth do better? I think uh, as young people, there's need for us to, first of all, continue to you know, build our capacity. It's, it's very, very important because, uh, of course, uh, this one is not about I am a graduate or something. So there's a topic on ground which is really different from, you know, the normal mathematics and, and all. 
So there is need for us to, you know, continue to build our capacity around our area of strength. You know, it's actually very important because a lot of discussion has, are actually happening, a lot of our cases and all. So there is need for us to have understanding of what is really happening around our area of, you know, uh, engagement, and it would really help us, uh, it would strategically position us to actually, you know, engage both at the national and also at the international level. Discussions happening, dialogues, engagement, it would really help us, uh, uh, you know, position ourselves. And another thing is, is for us to work together. So, uh, of course, there's, there's a lot of uh, gap. There's a lot of gap in, the, especially in, in the in, so Nigerian context now. There's a lot of a lot of gap in the in the climate change space. The inter 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 ministerial uh, committee are not really willing to actually work together. Even young people are not willing to work with one another. So, what we need to do better is to see how we can actually you know strengthen our collaboration. Because the good thing is that if we are able to strengthen our collaboration, we are able to you know, identify ourselves in different areas as, as it affects us in terms of climate change engagement, it will really help us position ourselves even strategically to the national government. Because a, a lot of commitments, even in Nigeria, even, uh, in Nigeria uh, the government of Nigeria made some commitments. How do we follow up with those commitments? If we are not, you know, united, if we are not working, you know, as collaborators, because there's one thing for you to see yourself as as as, as partners. There's one thing for another thing for you to see yourself as a competitor. As a competitor, so we are looking a fellow a fellow young person as oh, this is this one is a competitor. We are doing the same thing at all, and you are not looking in in area of collaboration. Yeah, you you might be close to the government, but then it will just be the same thing because. Government are, are not willing to, they, they are not willing to accommodate people who really tell them the truth. And even people that can, are going to tell them the truth are going to be diplomatic about it. So as, 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 as a formidable group of young people coming together, forming an alliance, it would be very good as it's up us to, you know, to form a very strong alliance and also hold our leaders accountable for their pledges. Because there's one thing for you to, for you to, you know, to make pledges but what are the effective and efficient humanitarian strategy on ground? And that is why up to, up to today, most of our policies in Nigeria end up being the same thing, like in terms of, yes, we launch a policy, but then what are the strategies to implement those policies? So when young people are not willing to, you know, play their own role by holding the government accountable, it's, it's, it will still cause us to the same thing. And young people is, is, is actually very, very key in all these discussions, not only all this dialogue, but then there's need for us to build that capacity, there's need for us to, you know, get engaged, you know, uh, uh, practical engagement, you know, and with, uh, apart from the English and the, and the discussions and the meetings and all, let us make sure we're actually doing something on ground that we can actually showcase going forward. And this is what we actually position of us, you know, not even at, not only at the national level, but at the international level. There's need for us to, you know, hold government accountable. There's need for us to bring these international and interministerial committees together because a, a minister of environment who is not willing to work like willingly with a minister of agriculture and all and other ministries. So there's need for us to actually close or bridge that gap. It's only young people that can actually build that gap by coming together as one and also holding them accountable and calling them to actually do what they really pledge to do. And this is what we can actually do. You know, it's also help us, uh, it's, it's really also help us personally and also help our career, help a lot of things around us. And also we see that, yes, we actually, you know, participating and adding our own voice to, you know, make the world sustainable and better for everyone. So it's it's not yeah. it's not about being a young person, it's about you know meaningful, meaningful engagement around you know the issue of discussion or discussion or the, the topic uh, we are actually discussing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is the last question and it's um, for Mohammed. So beyond um, COP27, are there regional conferences where discussions during COP27 are further advanced? 
since countries in the same region can relate more to what's going on among them, like in Nigeria now, we can relate more to the flood and everything that's going on when it comes to like um, our environment. So aside from COP27, that's the general one, are there any regional conferences? We had discussions during the COP27, um, COP27 are further discussed. Hello. Sorry, um, Sorry. the network kicked me out. Hello, Victoria. Can you please repeat the question? I said beyond COP twenty seven. I said, are there any uh, are there regional conferences where discussions during the COP twenty seven are further advanced because each country know what's happening in like in Nigeria now, we know what's happening in our own environment. So beyond COP27, are there regional conferences where discussions during the COP27 are further advanced? Like the discussions that we had in COP27, are there regional um, conferences that happen within each countries to further discuss what was discussed in COP27? Well, Did you get that? Um... Yeah, I, I got your question, and um, I actually know that there are meetings usually at a global level that are done in, in respect to the outcomes of COP27 and in preparation for COP28. Um, just like um, uh, I know there are the SBs, the SBTAs, there are meetings, high level meetings, where most of the decisions for COP are actually reached upon. I think for COP26, I think um, the decision to support South Africa on issues around um, phasing out coal, the decision was made at the SBs, just like as is mentioned, even for the issue of Bangladesh, that same decision was uh, reached upon at uh, SBs in Bonn. So I know there are a series of meetings to be done in respect to each of uh, the negotiations, just like um, the, the mitigation work program, now following up with issues around um, the funding for loss and damage, because the negotiations just concluded that there will be funding for loss and damage. How does the fund comes? How is it to be disposed? Uh, disposed? We don't know. So probably COP28 will, is going to decide that and series of meetings might take place uh, before prior to COP28 in order to, to ensure that it is actualized. But um, the meeting I know regional is uh, the, the usually the regional climate weeks that takes place uh, across all the, the, the continents in the world. I think that's the only regional meeting I know that takes place and usually is in preparation for the upcoming COP. It's hardly you see such meetings uh, in respect uh, of uh, or, or as uh, a follow up for nego uh, agreements and um, endpoints of negotiations from the previous COP. Even though I know there are high level meetings, ministerial meetings that takes place to follow up with all this, but most of them are not actually open to the public as, except uh, for some INGOs and NGOs with uh, some level of uh, accreditation that might be part or follow up with that. And um, it's left for us as young people and, um, and individuals to work together to bring up such issues by asking a lot of questions like, um, oh, we agree that there will be fun for, uh, for loss and damage. What next? I think the major responsibility is on our shoulders as young people, because if we didn't keep asking questions, agitating for them to do the right thing, I think this issue might die off. Okay. Either they are or they are sure that we engage all parties responsible. Just like to keep asking questions, and we cannot 
whatever we do. And um, our collaborate and work together as unity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we've um, come to an end of our question and answer. It was very insightful for me. I'm sure it was insightful for every other person because I learned about the importance of the loss and damage funding. I learned about unity amongst youth for us to do better. I also, um, we are, I learned a lot. I learned um, career positioning. So uh, do and does anybody have any question for the panelist? Any question? Okay. Uh, in the absence of none. Okay, I can get, I think there's a question. Okay, no question. In the absence of um, no question, so I would just like to put it out there. We'll be having our next um, training section on um, December, Saturday, December 3rd, 2022. And it's going to be 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. The topic is first aid treatment and our facilitator will be Dr. Cassandra Akide. And I'm going to apologize on behalf of